Let's have a discussion about our, our recapitulation of the swish when you did the swish with your partners. What came up? What did you learn? Any difficulties? Any discoveries? If I approach them like this closely, is that sufficient, do you yes. suppose? OK, great. Pardon me, could you talk into my, <laughs> talk to the hand, just talk to the, <laughs> all right, well then, uh, someone had a comment, is that right? Yes. Yes, well, I was just up here. <laughs> no, Ron has, um, I find it uh, difficult, or he has, uh, he finds it difficult to have. Uh, nice catch. <laughs> a, I find it difficult. No, he, no, he finds it difficult. No, I find it difficult. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, he. So uh, <sighs> he couldn't represent a, a picture of himself or the way he wants himself to be. He remembers himself when he's in his 20s, which is here. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard for him to put it there now right. on the qualities that he wants. To have. Okay. I think there's a lot of presupposition with that feeling as well. Like the older you get, the weaker you get, so to speak. Right. So the image that I want to have is a healthy image, but mm -hmm. it's not the kind of healthy image that I think is attainable. Uh, so you want to be 20 again? Is that what you're saying? I don't want to be 20 again. <laughs> I want yeah. to be healthy again. That's a healthy again. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if I associate youth with health. Ah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. probably a... Now, when you hear somebody say, I don't know if I associate youth with health, uh, what do you suppose may be going on in there? He's likely to be associating youth with health. Especially right. when he gets sick. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Youth, health, yeah, they go together. OK. So that was very difficult for me to actually make something realistic in the future. Mm -hmm. When I thought of myself being 20, projecting myself into the future as being healthy, mm -hmm. I could see that. But as I sit here now, it's hard for me to actually get that image for the future. OK. Yeah. All right, so you, you can hear the ecology flags yeah. popping up. Yeah. And they pop up at deep sort of conceptual or meaning levels. Like that really looks good. That I'd like to be able to do that, but that's he's 20, that's that kind of thing, yeah. right? So what might you do in a case like that? You want a, a representation of a near contemporary time or the near future when you're in, in good health and you could elicit other qualities you want to put in. And yet the, you know, it's like, well, those are all resident in my past. There's also a, an indication uh, factor in there. I want it now. Ah, you know what okay. I mean? And yeah. even when I was younger, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I didn't want to take the steps that were required. I wanted to have it immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can see that as being a problem as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So you get these levels within levels, first of all. If you look at the structure of it, the thing to keep in mind is the swish, if you think logical levels, right? We have behavior, capability, belief, identity. The swish is primarily an orientation that works at the, it's designed to work at the lower logical levels. It's, it's to shift behaviors or emotional responses in relationship to a cue or a trigger in the environment, right? It's not a belief change technique. It's not an identity change pattern. To some degree, it does educate a client to think differently. It gives them a different capability. So if you're gathering information like this from a client, as we are you know, talking to Ron, you get the notion that, well, there's some beliefs going on here. There's some deeper kind of structures that, that need to be explored in one way or another. So that's simply information gathering. Right? The one thing that I'm sure that you all learned in your, or experienced in your practitioner training is that just about every technique in NLP is designed to produce a specific result in relationship to some issue or some context, right? And that there is no all-purpose placebo, antibiotic, you know, this is the generalized pattern that works on everything. The answer is always in the client that you're working with. And your task is always to continue to elicit more and more information until you have a full structure of what the present state is and what the desired state is. And then you begin to, OK, so we need to bridge out into three or four different approaches. We do x, y, or z. We do some belief change work, possibly uh, timeline work to grow the self up, those kinds of things to make a comprehensive model. Right? So uh, interestingly enough, when Ron was working with Anwar, a sim not a similar, but uh, another kind of counterexample to the 
efficacious application of the swish came up in that Anwar's uh, trigger was coffee, right, and the taste of coffee. And uh, when Ron was gathering all this great information, it was very difficult to keep her out of her kinesthetics because it all had to do with the taste and what was going on in her mouth. And so that's very difficult to do a, you know, the, the assignment was to do a visual swish. So what happened with that little episode? Well, um, it was funny because there was an incongruency. As soon as we tried to do the swish the way we right. tried, um, there was a, a feeling of she wanted to feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. But there was also something else that was missing there. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we tried to do the swish, right. she would feel like, Ooh, well, why shouldn't I be satisfied? Right. And the coffee brought the satisfaction, satisfaction, but it was initiated with this kinesthetic feeling that, that yeah. right, it wasn't so much the visuals that were there. So this is all great feedback, right, to let you know that, well, okay, this pattern, this technique isn't the appropriate one. There may be something else to use, right? So those are both good learnings. We're, particularly in the, pra the practitioner training, ideally, you go through the pattern and it's novel enough that you learn it the way that it's schematically in the notes and you see the demonstration, so you master the pattern the way it is. In the master practitioner, you're actually going to learn more from these counterexamples where it didn't work, right? Because then you start thinking, well, how else can I put it, put it together? What more information do I need? So the map expands. What else came up in the swish? Everybody else have resounding success? Somebody had sweaty palms. <laughs> I, <laughs> I witnessed some of that. Well, I went through and um, I realized that there was like a red flag. I was like, this isn't. Doesn't feel right. Right. And I found looked at what the problem was. Mm -hmm. I realized I needed to kind of do a negotiation there too mm -hmm. of of the parts before I could do an integration. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of just went off in my own head and did my own thing and wound up not really doing a switch pattern, but right. it like triggered something that I thought like a lot of times you do an exercise like oh I'm gonna pick something small and just do the exercise right. learn from it. <laughs> and I got into it and I was like. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> this is referred to as the tip of the iceberg pattern where you go, oh, yeah. it's such an yeah. innocent looking little ice cube. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> boom. And, uh, it was really cool in the end. I mean, yeah. it turned out to be a really big thing. I've been working on myself. Yeah. It's really solved a problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, observation of this, so I'm probably not going to get it exactly right, but Anne did a great job of, you know, allowing you to integrate completely all the time you needed. But it had to do with the future self-image in relationship, was it to a, a, a relative, right? Uh, no, it was um, the way that I deal with certain things right now right. and the way that I want to deal with them. Right. And uh, just an overall thing. Like okay, people. great. So, uh, so at any rate, as she was doing this, she realized that in the future self, and as this was coming together, there was like a parts thing, really, that was going on. So she said, well, just give me some, you know, I want to process this, and kind of went into a trance, and it was amazing. It's like, you know, breathing changes, the palms got really sweaty, and it took uh, some time to reintegrate this until that future self could really gel as a congruent representation of who she was. And as she was saying, the first indication of this was a, was a red flag, an ecology flag about what was going on. And those are wonderful. Those are really great because they're going to give you the information of where to go next, what to put together to make it really work well. And part of it was because I've done the switch before and it's like instant. Yeah. And that was like this, I was like really working it. And I was like, why is this so difficult? And I was like right. straining. And then I was like, wait right. a second. Why am I straining? Let's look at what the problem is. Exactly. And get down to it and observe what the, the patterns, the structure, the, you know, strategy of the whole thing is, come up with a new thing. Yeah. 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 Well, this is a, there's a Greek, uh, in Greek mythology, there's a character named Procrustes, and he's an innkeeper, and he lives on top of a mountain where all the travelers go over, you know, and they spend the night at Procrustes' inn, and uh, unfortunately, he's, Procrustes has this little room that he rents out to folks, but unfortunately, uh, his, his bed, what he does is a, like a medium-sized bed, and he has this habit that, in his mind, the person must fit the bed, right? So if uh, you happen to be really a tall person and you lay down in Procrustes' bed, guess what he does? Huh? 
he makes you smaller by cutting off your legs. <laughs> right? Oh, it's a perfect fit. There in Pro Krusty's bed. Right? And if you're smaller, of course, what he does is he cuts the bed, and then he has to repair it the next day. And this is what happens when you rely on the pattern only, right? without any kind of flexibility. You attempt to force the person. Actually, I take that back. What he didn't cut the bed. He wasn't that kind of an individual. What he did is he stretched the person in the bed <clears throat> to fit the pattern or cut them off to fit the pattern. Right? So this is a sort of a, a caveat to not be reliant on the pattern. You be reliant on the structure that's being revealed through your information gathering and the other end of the universe that you're working with there, the other person. Psychotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's all systems and it's all changing. I mean, I actually find it astounding that NLP was able to identify such stable structures in consciousness that, that are applicable to so many people in so many different situations because humans are slippery. Mm -hmm. They really are. You know, I was talking to Charles about that last night. It's a little bit of field of what we're doing, but he was talking about a book that he's reading that is a, a researcher that is researching symptomology over historical time, right? And what this guy is discovering is that when medical science develops a treatment protocol for a social problem, a new problem pops up, right? So for example, uh, in Freud's day, the unsolvable problem was hysteria. However, that was defined in the medical terminology, right? If there was something that no one could quite treat because no one knew quite what it was, it was hysteria. And then as that began to be more and more treatable and the medical profession changed and et cetera, et cetera, what happens is that the profession kind of stabilizes and then something else. So it's like the current one is like stress, right? And what is it in the mind-body thing? And it's, you know, these sort of environmental stressors and how do you deal with them? That a number of years, 15 or 20 years ago, it was not even on the radar. So there's something about humans that tend to be slippery. And if you've noticed what's outside the windows of this room, you know, the universe, cosmos, the reality of which we make maps, it also tends to be slippery. And it's constantly changing. So our ability to identify recurrent patterns in NLP is real primary to the work that we do. And yet sometimes, as I say, <laughs> the interior environment, the interior topography can be as slippery as the outside one, changing in ways that don't quite fit a pattern. Sort of looks like it on the surface, but you get deeper and other things reveal themselves. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, when I first went to Malaysia in the early 80s, there were lots and lots of examples of mm -hmm. hysteria. Right. Social Absolutely, yeah. And it's not happening in yeah. other places. For, a, for a, an interesting uh, read, read the, one of the appendices of the DSM-4, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health, uh, Volume 4, the current one. In the back, they have a whole listing of culturally specific symptomology, right? And in some cultures, the one you're describing, hysteria and trance possession uh, some Inuit tribes in the far north have a similar kind of thing, and they all have a real specific etiology, a very uh, specific structure that, you know, mental health and health care providers in that culture know how to deal with, but they don't appear in other parts of the world. So we're each, a, not only individually, but as cultures, we have our own kind of ecology of everything, including the problems that we tend to manifest. Because no, no anorexia until recently. Right. A recent global statistic, the last five, yeah. years. Right. Yeah. So there's always new patterns out there to discover, hence the field of NLP will continue to expand. Are the components to those patterns similar though? And what I mean by that is obviously we all deal with submodalities. Yeah. You know what I mean? So somebody who might fall under the category of having anorexia, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on in that person's mind, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you can discover the submodalities, the beliefs, and so on and so forth. Right. So I think maybe there's an underlying um, structure that's mm -hmm. going to be similar across boards. Mm -hmm. 
I think I, I think I would agree with you, and it's kind of the holy grail. You know, Robert Diltz has been looking for a unified theory in the realm of NLP, and he's one of the most integrative systems thinkers in the field of NLP. He just keeps putting together these marvelous models, right? It's funny because I just came from the uh, hidden curriculum of everyday living, uh -huh. and basically, uh, and not so gently, uh, <laughs> Steve Andreas and Charles Faulkner took a shotgun to a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And it was very interesting right. because it's... It's, a, it's another underlying structure. Ab absolutely. Right. Yeah, very fascinating, to right. say the least. I recommend it for everybody. Yeah. Very interesting. This one was just... This was their, their first run through, their first uh, time they presented this together. I think it was recorded on audio tape, right? It was, yeah. Those will likely to be. And I've been talking to both of them. It's a real fascinating thing they were, they were playing. You can talk to Ron at break or off times to find out exactly what went on there. Very good point. Woo! <laughs> All right, well, let's consider one of these slippery situations in which uh, you're working with a client and uh, they have a response or a behavior that they want to change, right? And it's in something's going on in the world and they have an unwanted behavior or response to it. But you begin exploring and it doesn't seem as if it's a visual thing. It's not like some image that puts them in the unpleasant state. It's something else, some other trigger. Perhaps it might be auditory. Anybody got voices that plug them in, or when you hear a certain person in a certain voice? That what happens if the if the triggers or the the cue doesn't fit the pattern of Procrustes' bed? Doesn't fit just right. Do you have sort through your experience of your of your own lives or lives of clients? Do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, Paul. I, th I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, for me, I recognize it again this morning. There was a stupid advertisement on the radio right. about very, very low, deep bass that you need to have. Right. <laughs> it pisses you off. It pisses you off. <laughs> ah, interesting. So you you hear that deep ba bass voice and. Well, it's not only the voice. It, it's the. Uh, 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 the the deep bass that they're promoting. Earth rocking thing, you know, you're driving along and you got a car next to you and your own car is naked because they they got that one cranked up, yeah. right? So it's an auditory input. Right. Right? And it sounds like it's one that's kind of like right at a threshold of it's not like really a pleasant because you play the drum. Well, yeah, it, it's not the same thing as playing the drum. Right. How's it different? Well it's auditorily. Different in that, I mean, auditorily it's it's different. It's, it's more different kinesthetically a little bit uh -huh. than okay. auditorily. Gotcha. Because for some reason or other, I feel it in my body. Right. You know, I don't only hear it in my ear. Yeah. I feel vibration. So this commercial comes on, na, 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 and pretty soon you're vibrating to that in your body and it doesn't feel good. So right. it's an auditory stimulus that has a real kinesthetic component. Yeah. And then an emotional response, oy, oy, oy. <laughs> turn that down, right? Yeah. All right. So that's an interesting one. Come on up here, let's play with it. I think uh, s particularly since you were volunteering at break that uh, you brought your drum with you up here, yeah. and it's a buffalo hide drum. Right. How big is it? Uh, Ooh, good yeah. size. It, it's a good size. It's, uh, I don't know the exact dimensions, but I, I think it's just circular. <laughs> ah, sure, it's, absolutely. Uh, well. Maybe a 16-inch radius. All right. So makes it uh, 32 inch circle, 32 inch circle. Yeah. And the circumference would be pi r squared, right? Or yeah, is that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how long have you been playing the drum? Uh, I just adopted this uh, in like um, uh, roughly about September of last year. And you've been playing with a group? Right, uh, periodic, not, not every night or not every week. But uh, there are certain times uh, in the year that uh, drumming is, is part, you know, it's part of astrology and things like that. Sure. And I don't really pay attention to that facet of it. Uh, what, is it what is it that you like about, say, 10 or 12 people and they've got drums, maybe tambourines, and the beat's really there and you're tuned with it? What is it about that that uh, you enjoy? Okay. What I enjoy is it's being done for... 
uh, therapeutic type purpose mm -hmm. in a sense. Right. Uh, we <laughs> pretty abstract, <laughs> you say. Yeah, you see, you have what's called a mother drum. Yeah. And the mother drum is the drum that has a constant beat right. that guides this whole thing. Right. And the persons on there are four people on the mother drum. One person is the vocalizer. Right. The vocalizer presents a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a purpose for the drumming, uh -huh. be it healing a certain sickness, Sets, remembering past right. relatives, uh -huh. things like that. And uh, the uh, the mother drum begins the beat, and then the rest of the drummers can uh -huh. follow in. Uh -huh. uh, also, there's one for the north, south, east, and west, uh -huh. which are minor drums. Uh, and the mother drum will determine the frequency, the, the, how fast the drumming is taking place or how right. slow. Right. And then... Uh, will it also determine volume? Uh, well, volume is kind of dependent on everybody's drum, how right. it's made. Okay. Uh, it's not the same kind of a drum as you have in a show mm -hmm. or in a regular band. Mm -hmm. uh, so the drumming goes on and there's this energy that comes up. Right. Uh, in, in the drumming, and, and of course, the, the people with their individual drums, they can walk around, dance around, and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, to release uh, expressions. Okay, great. So the reason I'm doing this information gathering is I, I think I'm kind of fishing here for a counterexample to what his stated problem state was. A, an unwanted response to uh, repetitive uh, auditory input that didn't feel good in his body, and he had a bad response to it. So let's explore this. Let's take the, the drumming circle and just kind of set it aside at a distance okay. way over there. So it's out in the forest somewhere. And uh, let me know about this commercial this, that you hear. What goes on when you hear that? OK. Uh, it's, it's annoying, for first off. It, what is it? it it's, it's, it has a tendency to disrupt my thinking. Okay, and what is it specifically that, how does it disrupt your thinking? I mean, you, so you're thinking there, and then what happens? It... Here's what I want you to do. Let's assume that I'm going to fill in for you for a day. You get to go on a vacation wherever you want. I'm going to be you. So I have to be able to do everything that you do. Okay. All right? So one of the things I need to be able to do is this, have this response to that commercial. Uh-huh. All right? So you have to teach me how to do it. All right, so uh, I, would I be in my car? Yes, you right. could be in the car. Or sometimes it happens in, in a building. All right, let's assume for this one I'm driving in my car, and I'm, uh, see, you said it disrupts your train of thought, so I'm, I'm thinking about something. Yeah. Right? I'm enjoying my thoughts about something. Then what do I do? Okay. Uh, it, it's a matter of, the, the thought patterns that I'm in and the, the, the state that I'm in is relatively mellow, relaxed. Uh, you know, I actually am enjoying the radio station that's on there. Okay. And uh, it just, it, it, it's like having uh, a cross cut. In other words, if things, things are flowing this way, all of a sudden you got something that comes in like this. All right, I kind of, I watched your hands. I mean, I know what your hands are doing, but I'm not sure how to do that inside. Okay. I don't know how to do that inside. my experience. So I'm listening, yeah. I'm driving down the road. I have a train of thought going. I'm enjoying what's on the radio. Yeah. Right? And what that might be a talk show or music or whatever, right. anything. Mm -hmm. Enjoying that, good train of thought, driving the car. Then what do I do to have this unwanted response? What do I have to hear or experience or what well, happens? Well, you hear, hear this. The very, very deep bass, which is uh, a type of sound almost <laughs> like from a bomb. I mean, only it's... Yeah. All right. Yeah, a bomb or an explosive. It just happens how many times? Just well, once? It's, no, it's continuous because the, the, way they, the way they're reproducing it right. is it's one tonal level, one frequency that's vibrating at uh, a particular rate which, which would be like a, a bomb or an explosive. Okay, so real deep resonant bass, and they're piled one on top or one after, right after the other kind of thing? Right, right. All right, and then what does that do to me? I can get that one. Uh-huh. 
Then what do I do? Well, that wow. takes the pleasant waves or vibrations that my body is in and right. my mental state is in, right. and it totally disrupts them. Okay, so I want to slow that one down. It takes them and disrupts them how? You were saying earlier that you feel it kinesthetically. After I hear this bomb explosion repetitive sound with my ears, how does that translate to feeling in my body? What do, I, what do you feel? So I can feel it too. I haven't actually paid attention to a kinesthetic feeling in my body. Okay. Well, just let me know what I would do next then after hearing the, this deep auditory input, uh -huh. bomb-like sounds, repetitive. What do I need to do next? I hear them. I, 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 need, I need to maintain my cool. <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh, so something obviously had happened. Yeah, there's the, in the way of kinesthetic feelings, yeah. uh, they're, they're, what I'm doing is uh, my kinesthetic feelings want to go to tension, and I'm trying okay. to control the kinesthetic gotcha. feelings. All right, from so going if I want tension. to make my kinesthetic feelings want to go to tension, what do I do in my body? Well, I, 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 don't really, I don't really want to, to make them go to no, tension. No, I, I understand that, but I, you need to educate me into how to do this so that I. Oh, okay, fully I, understand now I understand. Yeah. So if. Boom, 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 and yeah. how does the tension? Uh, uh, tension is, it, if I'm at a stoplight, tension kind of, I'll, I'll press harder on the brake pedal. Gotcha, so the muscles begin to kind of tighten, tighten up. up. Yeah. Okay, that's probably sufficient. You don't need, that's fine. We don't need to dig a deep hole, and, and then after you feel the tension, how badly could you? you know. <laughs> we need enough of it to understand the structure. Right? And this little strategy of you know, modeling him me filling in for him is a great way to gather information, right? So rather than sort of putting him on the spot, what do you do next, what do you do next, it's more of a frame of, well, hey, teach me how to do what you do. I, I'd like to understand it. So now I have a pretty good idea internally of the structure of this. And this could fit the structure, that, uh, something that would yield to the swish quite, quite nicely because it's an external sensory input that leads to an unwanted internal response. In this, in this case, First of all, a tightening of the body, you know, increase of tension, and then a losing of a train of thought and a good feeling. Right? All of this from this auditory input. Right? But if, if I have to put it in Procrustes' bed, it would be very difficult to do visually because it's not a visual trigger. Right? So we need to think, okay, what can we do auditorily? And we understand the principle of the swish. The principle of the swish, let me stand behind you for a moment, okay. is as follows. It's kind of like a graph here. And on this side, you've got intensity. And on this side, you've got time. And the way that a swish works is that the Q, whatever it is, starts off at a really, really high intensity, right? In other words, if it's visual, it's right there in front of your face. So it's a real high intensity. And then over a relatively short period of time, you reduce that to, to zero by taking the image and zooming it off to the horizon. So the intensity drops over time. And simultaneously, at exactly the, in the, at the same time, the positive response to the future self-image, you know, the resourceful response, starts off with a very low intensity. It's off in the distance, it's nothing. But it increases very rapidly to a high intensity. And both of these happen at the same time. One goes down, the other one comes up. Right? So that's the principle behind the swish. So what we need to find are, in this situation, some submodalities that are auditory that are also analog submodalities. Right? In other words, they vary across the range right? so that we can turn them up and turn them down kind of thing. I just caught sense of what might be a meta in this kind of thing. Yeah. There's, there's a strong sense that my space is being violated. Right. My privacy or right. my space. Yeah. And this is what happens. Boundaries. Right. We have, a, we have a, a particular kind of environmental trigger and an unwanted response. We have enough of those or enough samples of that event over time. And what the brain, do, what the mind does with it is it starts understanding it, giving meaning to it. Well, it's invading my space. It's this, it's that. We build a kind of structure based on this response, right? But in a sense, the, 
working with submodalities shifts the very structure of it. And as a result, quite often, the meaning that we give to it changes too, without even working with that meaning in any way at all, except changing the meaning of the stimulus or how we experience it. So let's explore this. Um, what I'd like you to do is take that you know, explosive, bomb-like auditory, right? And I want you to begin to slow it down, right? In other words, put uh, some more time in between each beat of it, right? And imagine listening to it that way so it's more, there's more time in between each one, all right? And what happens? Does it change the way you feel about it in any way? It, it sort of mellows out. All right. Yeah. Now, how could I probably have predicted that? What did I see him do? Gave that nice, as soon as I did it, he processed it very rapidly, and there was a nice deep breath, and the upper part of the body kind of dropped down. So I'm kind of, you know, I kind of figured he might say that it was changing it. So it changes your response when there's more, a greater time inter interval in between each one. Right. right. The tempo slows down a bit. Yeah, it gets right. to be more like a little bit of the drumming circle. Okay, great. How about when not only the tempo slows down a bit, but the volume of it drops? That's even better. All right, great. So we, now we have two submodalities that affect this in a powerful way, the tempo and the volume. And when they go down, when they decrease, right, then he feels better about it, all right? Let's take it even further. Let's take it, make the tempo really elongated so there's a big, long, I mean, like a four-second pause, and as you're increasing the time between each pulse, it's getting softer and softer and softer and softer. So that it's happening about every 10 seconds, and you can barely hear it. Mm -hmm. That's great. 